This is Bob Baxter the, with the USMC BTA, United States Marine Corps Vietnam Tankers Association. We're in Washington, D.C. This interview is being conducted with Rick Langley. Okay, I live in uh, Lompoc, California, just a little ways north of Santa Barbara. I was in Vietnam in night from July 1966 to August 1967, and I served with uh, Charlie Company first, first platoon Charlie Company, and then fourth platoon Alpha Company, third tank battalion, third Marine Division. Okay. And you got in the country when again? In July of 1966. Okay. Uh, could you kind of tell us a little bit what, about what Vietnam and the Vietnamese War was like at that point? Uh, yeah, I was actually drafted into the Marine Corps. I waited to be drafted and I thought I'll go in the Army and I'll go be a Jeep driver in Germany. Well, it didn't work out that way. And I, when I got to, to Vietnam, it was, you know, pretty much a, a Viet, the war with the Viet Cong. It was, most of it was down south and so I thought, yeah, this is not bad. And I checked into the battalion and I was sent to Charlie Company, which was actually and battalion was at Da Nang, and Charlie Company was actually located in Phu Bai. And I went up there by plane, C-47, with a bunch of, of locals and their chickens and their goats and everything. And, you know, I flew up to Phu Bai, checked in, and they <coughs> assigned me to 1st Platoon Charlie Company, which, and to uh, Sergeant Jones, who was the tank commander, on Charlie One Deuce. It's with Charlie One Two. And, uh, we at that time had five crewmen, so we had an extra crewman at all times. And uh, they were not doing much as far as combat action at that time. They, had li they were living in hardback tents. They had hot showers. They had a, a mess hall with hot food. They had movies every night, you know, and I thought, man, this is great. You know, I can do this standing on my head. So this lasted about three weeks. And then the word came down, Charlie Company 1st Platoon was going to Dong Ha. And uh, everybody goes, where in the hell is Dong Ha? You know, and so the lieutenant told us where it was, what we were doing, and what they had found was that the NVA were infiltrating across the DMZ in pretty large numbers. So 3rd Marine Division was going to go north to curtail this action, you know. So being an extra crewman, Instead of going with the tanks, which were loaded on LSTs and, and floated north, uh, I, I was assigned to a jeep with the first sergeant as his, you know, riding shotgun, and we were to drive like the 60 miles from way up to Dong, up to Dong Ha. So I got in the jeep, got my M14 that they gave me, and a couple magazines, you know, and I'm, I, you know, I'm scared to death. I knew every, every. Vietnamese that we passed on the road had an AK in his pajamas and was going to, you know, let us have it. And uh, we were in a recall, pretty... Do you recall specifically when this was, the date? The date? Not really. It, it had to be around probably between the middle of July and the 1st of August. 1966. 1966. This was when the big, the big move north. And uh, we got up there and there was not much at, at Dong Ha other than an airstrip an Air Force in, you know, unit was up there, and there was a, a few infantry units, grunt units in the area. We were the, actually the first tanks to go to Dong Ha. And then from there, we moved out into the, you know, the area and, and started operations. Operations Hastings started right after we arrived. Actually, Bravo Company sent a contingent of tanks up not too long after we got there. So we were actually the first tanks in the air. The, the infantry had no idea how to operate with tanks. We had no idea how to really operate with infantry. So it was all, you know, trial and error at that point. Uh, you said it was, you believed it to be Operation Hastings. Yeah. Do uh, you recall how long that lasted or anything that you recall that happened <coughs> on that operation? Uh, uh, operation Hastings was a big, the big push north and, and you know, I, I remember you, you really couldn't tell when one operation ended, you know, and one operation began because it just ran together. You didn't have any idea, you know, 
One day you're on Operation Hastings, the next day you're on Operation Prairie. So we, they didn't really know what to do with us. So we did a, a couple of patrols. Our first combat action was out of Cam Low, where they had, had set us up to go in and train grunts on what to do around tanks and what not to do, because we didn't want to run over anybody or shoot anybody, you know. Uh, you know. So we, we, our first operation, we left out of Cam Low, and the night before, my tank commander, Sergeant Jones, came to me, and I was, you know, I'd been there less than a month. And he says, oh, you're gonna be the driver tomorrow. You know, so I'm going, you know, this is you know, not putting any pressure on you. You know, and they told us, you know, you're going to go up there and there's, there's NVA all over the area. So you're going to get into the stuff. And we, we took off, crossed the Camlo River. My first driving experience going across the Camlo River was take it easy. I about drowned myself. You know, and we went in, we swept through a couple of villages, you know, didn't see any action. And then they, this grunt commander's taking us down this little trail or it was a road, then it went to a trail, then it went to a footpath, and then it was just kind of a wide spot in the, in the brush. And Sergeant Jones is getting antsy, and he says, he didn't like this, they, they we're getting too confined in the area, we didn't have anywhere to maneuver. And sure enough, we went under this, these low-lying trees, and the NVA had hung the artillery around in the trees. Command detonated it right over one of the tanks. And at our tanks, we had grunts on board. One guy was killed, a couple of guys were wounded, and then the ambush broke out. And we were, you know, we were in such tight quarters there that they were right on top of us. And the, the, the thing was, if the NVA had waited, a, moved the ambush 100 yards down the trail, we wouldn't have been able to traverse the turret. But at this point, we could still traverse the turret to the right, and we, we'd started firing canister rounds, and, you know, the grunts jumped off the tanks and there were hand grenades going back and forth, you know, and I've got my seat down, but I don't have the hatch closed. And I can kind of see this through the parasote and I can pick, you know, I can peek up, you know, and tracers going all over the place and they're bouncing off the turret and, so you know. For anybody who's obviously watching this sometime <clears throat> in the future, could you explain what a canister round is? Oh, a canister round is like a big shotgun shell. And it shoots out these little, at that time they used the ones that were around elongated like pellet. And I don't know how many thousands of these things were in one of these rounds, but they do a lot of damage. And we use them to clear brush and you could, at times I've seen canister rounds and you can see them, arms and legs and heads flying and stuff. They're pretty bad things. Now this, these canister rounds, what size were they? They were a 90 millimeter, the main gun, main, main gun. And uh, they were probably, we probably fired more canister rounds than anything else over there. They were there. Later they went to a, to a, where they shot a little dart, which I guess was really devastating. So anyway, we're, we're you know, in the middle of this firefight and the NVA realizes that they screwed up their ambush and the tanks were really not something to mess with. So they backed off. We met a few guys and then we headed back south and uh, we had one tank hit a mine, one of the Bravo Company tanks hit a mine. We spent the night there with them and uh, we got mortared and, you know, sniper fire and then made our way back to Cam Low where we reassessed and reevaluated what we'd done right and what we'd done wrong, which the whole time I was there, every time you got into a firefight, you went back and you said, well, what, do we, what, do we, what mistakes did we make here? What could we do differently? And, and added to our playbook, I guess, as to how to, how to operate in this country. And, uh, so basically then in 1966, when you're there, you guys are learning how to fight with tanks. Yeah, in a, in a difficult terrain, a lot of marshy, you know, wood or uh, rice paddy type situations. Up in the north, it, there weren't as many rice paddies. It was just rough terrain, you know pretty well, not really jungle, but a heavy brush, you know, and uh, up around Contian, it was more kind of open space and hedgerows and, and that kind of stuff. Uh, you said that, that the one operation just kind of morphed into the next operation, uh, particularly with Hastings, how long were you out there, do you remember? 
we would we would did this one little two day operation and then we would then they realized well you know maybe we don't want tanks up in the, because they had problems with the tanks hitting mines and so we were kind of held back in the rear we did road sweeps and convoy escorts between Cam Lo and 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 uh, Dong Ha and then uh, the, another incident that happened they they decided well because the the area was so large they had moved an artillery uh, unit out from Camlo and and out farther and it was on rather than the Camlo base that everybody most people know about was on on the north side of, of Highway 9 and they moved this artillery unit down and they were on the south side of 9 so they could support the grunts on even farther out but they were still having trouble getting artillery support because of the range so somebody we don't know who had the bright idea and all these tanks they they got a longer range than most of our artillery if we run them up on ramps you know so they send us out to and I think it was probably a heavy section three tanks and they send us out to this little artillery outpost which was a perimeter with some Constantino wire around it. it was about a hundred yards across and they had a, the one artillery unit in there and so they send us out there and we run our tanks up on ramps and we do all the sighting in and stuff that we really knew nothing about we'd never been trained on how to do this or anything so we do this and we're out there you know but we, it's good because the artillery unit has tents for us so we're sleeping in tents on cots and they had a mess hall so that was it was pretty good you know and we'd we'd fire H and I fire which is harassment and interdiction fire at night you know two or three rounds here two or three rounds there and and a couple times we had pretty significant uh, support roles in fire we fired a lot of rounds when they when they needed it but not, mostly it was two or three rounds every hour or so from you know they give it coordinates and we put it in well, okay when you began doing this H and I firing how long in terms of days weeks oh this was just maybe a week or two weeks that we were doing this and then one night one day they come to us and they say well you're, you know your grunts that have their little their little positions up here on the side of this hill where we were right behind the hill and they were kind of up on the other side of the hill they say you know they're leaving today and so we said well yeah okay and what does that leave who's coming in there there's nobody and so they said okay take two tanks pull the 30 caliber machine guns out of them and let's put them up in these two holes up here the grunts had not really they were like foxholes you get three guys in them and they had a sandbag top on them on you know old fence posts so we said oh okay so we go up there my tank commander was sergeant siva which I mean, a lot of people know sergeant siva he's in one hole i'm in another hole with our gunner and uh, our loader and uh, so you know we figure it's going to be a quiet night so i'm about two o'clock in the morning i'm laying up on a bunch of sea ration cardboard boxes to, trying to sleep and uh, all we hear this kind of explosions on the other side of the perimeter and you know we you know what's going on over there and they weren't like they weren't mortar explosions they sounded more like hand grenades and stuff so we we thought well somebody's probing the wire you know and the grunts are setting off claymores or something so you know and it kind of goes on and then it kind of intensifies and then there's these unusual explosions that we hear that didn't sound like hand grenades or claymores and uh, you know a lot of small arms fire then so I get back down in the hole and uh, you know we hear more and more and more and then behind us maybe 50 yards behind us where the tanks we had kind of a tank park we had a tank retriever there at the time and we see this fire you know so ooh, something something serious is going on now the the small arms fire is really really constant you see a lot of a lot of tracers a lot of green tracers from the NVA so about this time the tank pulls up beside her hole and says that the NVA are inside the wire and that if you see anybody anybody walking around their NVA you know shoot them so Sellers and Whittington who was our loader they're they're managing the machine gun I got an M14 and I'm in the back of the bunker watching our back so just you know I'm watching and I see this 
this figure over by where Siva's fighting hole is, and I see him sneaking up behind him. So you know, I get the M14 up, and I'm I'm right on him, ready to fire. And then I hear Siva. Siva always carried a, a M1 carbine that he either bought off of some Arvin or stole. You know. <laughs> anyway, so and then, and then all of a sudden I hear this M, this fully automatic M1 carbine, and he just stitches the guy, and he goes down. So I go, Phew, that's that's you know. Bad stuff. So I'm watching, and then I can see in the the flames from the burning retriever. I see this figure coming up over the hill, you know, and he's kind of crouched down. And then he'll stand up and look, and I think he's looking for our our machine gun hole, and he keeps coming. So I I'm waiting, and I pull up that M14, and I take the safety off, and when he stands up, you know, I just I fired about seven or eight rounds, and I'm thinking I'm just scared shitless, you know. I know this, did I hit the guy? Is he down, is he just laying there? Has he got a hand grenade, what's, you know? And then the whole time this huge firefight's going on. So it goes on until, well, the sun starts to come up for five, five, four or five in the morning. And uh, then it, it subsides. We're getting a few mortar rounds, but it's pretty much over, you know, and then if somebody calls the all clear and they come up and they say, okay, you guys, you know, go out, police up the area, check for bodies and check for anybody that's alive or anything like that. So I go up to Siva's home, we check out the guy that he shot. And it was like, the kid was like 13 years old. He had a wooden rifle. He didn't even have a real rifle, you know, and that was all he had. So I go back to look for the guy that I thought I had shot and then I found him and I'd hit him three times and he came right in the throat the, the last time and it just took his spine out. But it was like a lieutenant and he had a, a 32 caliber pistol on a lanyard. So I took the pistol and he had a small bag, like, you know, canvas bag. And I looked through the bag and he didn't have anything that was like, you know, looked like it was important. And I looked and he had a wallet, and, you know, and he had pictures in his wallet and stuff, you know, so. That was kind of hard to do, you know, and I, I never would, would ever do that again if, you know, if I shot somebody or, you know, something like that, if they, I wouldn't search through bodies. But I took the stuff and they had an area where they wanted you to bring anything like that in case there was important papers. And uh, we were talking afterwards, it, it, it was funny, we go after this and there's these dead bodies from the NVA laying all over, you know, in, not not pretty sight. And we walked right by them and went right into the chow hall and had you know scrambled eggs and stuff. And they gather all the bodies up. And I don't remember if they buried them there, if they brought in a dozer and dug a hole, or if they. I think they trucked them out. But you know there were 89 bodies in that in inside the perimeter. And they'd come in. They'd actually set up a medical unit there. They and they had supplies from the Quakers that, you know, it said right on it, you know, from the USA, you know, plasma bottles and that kind of stuff, plastic tubing. So that was, you know, one of our, our first combat actions. Do you recall what, when this was, time frame? This, this was August 29th, 1966. There's actually, in some of the Marine Corps books, there's actually pictures of the, of the area and the dead bodies. Mm -hmm. And they're talking about this. And come to find out, they actually knew that they were going to try to overrun us. The intelligence knew that, but they never told us. You know, so we we fired our machine gun. We burned out two two barrels, and went through I don't know how many thousands of rounds of ammunition. This is on your machine gun. Yeah, yeah. And in fact, when the tank came when the tank came up to tell us about you know what was happening, the guy gave us a, a we had one barrel and he gave us another barrel and all the ammunition he could you know spare and we didn't find any bodies out in front of our hole we found a lot of blood so we know they were trying to come up that side too and uh, but that was needless to say and that was the first time that we saw an RPG if somebody found this RPG it was a, it was the two you know the original one and we thought well it's a piece of bamboo with some black tape on it and a handle you know but it was an RPG, but that was the first time we'd ever seen an RPG, you know. And somebody says, well, what is that? Well, it's an anti-tank weapon. Oh, great, we need this, you know, this is good. So that was uh, quite an experience. Not a phrase tankers like to hear. No, no, no. You know, and, and uh, we just, we continued on from there. We, we, at that time, 
we did the H&I fire for a while, and then we were called down to, to one of the infantry units was heading out toward the rock pile which was going to be because they, they were having they were getting a lot of sightings from the reconnaissance people on the rock pile that they were NVA in the area. And I think the name of the guy, I don't remember the unit, it might have been 2-4, but I think the name of the, the commander was Colonel Bell. And uh, so they're heading out there and they're, they're going on foot down Highway 9 and they, they come to this area where you go up kind of over a hill and then it makes a right turn and goes down along the side of a hill and down into a gully and then there's a cliff face on the other side. And the, the, the infantry was down along this, this side of this hill and on that cliff face there was a bunch of NVA in, in caves. And they opened up on them. Well, they couldn't get down and they couldn't get back up. But if they laid down, they were, they were covered by the way the, roads, the road would slope. So these, this you know, bunch of these grunts were trapped in there. So this Lieutenant Bell, or C Colonel Bell, he, he calls back and he says, send me up some tanks. I think we went up there, I think two of us, two tanks went up there. And we stopped at the top of the hill where the Colonel was and he says, I got my guys down here. He says, I, we can't, we don't have any firepower to take these, these grunts out of these caves. So he says, we need you to go down there and do that for us. And, uh, oh, yeah, we can do that. So we, we pull over the top of the hill and head down, you know, and immediately we start taking like, I mean, heavy machine gun fire from the, over the, on this cliff face, which we just button up. And we, you know, you can hear it clanking off the turret. And we pull down there a little ways and stop and traverse the gun, and we just start shooting these, these caves. Well, the, the fire stops pretty quickly, you know, and you can see the, the NVA trying to get out of the caves and up over the top of the hill, and so we killed a lot of them that day. But you know, the grunts are all cheering and stuff, you know, and they think this is great. So we, we back it up, you know, and we're, we're back up there. And so we say, okay, Colonel, we'll see you later. We're going, and I, he says, no, no. He says, I want you to call back and get your other three tanks up here. I think we need you to go with us up to the rock pile. So he makes the command decision that we're, we're going. So we, we went to the rock pile. We were the first tanks at the rock pile. We were there, I don't know, probably a month, maybe six weeks and did a lot of operations out in there. And it was tough, tough country to operate in, real hilly, you know. And at that time, it was just starting to rain and everything was getting slick and, and you're, we you're were- You're talking monsoon season. Here. Yeah, well, it wasn't quite monsoon, but it was starting, you know. So we, you know, would have trouble. You'd start to go up a hill and the grass would just let go and it would, you know, to, to this day, if I'm like walking in a park or something like that and there's a lawnmower and you hit that, that newly cut grass and the smell of diesel fuel together, it's just like, whoa, that's, you know, one of those flashback moments. Now, were you still a driver at this point? Yeah, I was a driver for most of the time that I was over there. I wasn't real interested in being in the turret. You know, I liked what I did, you know. Now, at some point, did you go on an R&R? &R? I, yeah, it, I wasn't going to go on R&R because &R I, I don't, I just wasn't really, really interested in doing that. But in April of 67, after we'd seen some pretty bad stuff, myself and another guy, we decided we'd go on R&R. &R. And we went to Hong Kong, had a great time for five days, spent $500 and I brought back an $18 set of earrings for my wife. <laughs> and I'm not saying where the other, the other part of that money went. Uh, having been to Hong Kong, I know. <laughs> <laughs> it was well spent. It absolutely, was well spent. Absolutely. Yeah. So, uh, so you did a standard 13 month tour then? 13 months and 12 days. Okay. Did you extend your tour at all? Or I like did that? not extend my tour. I was, uh, like I said, when we, before we went to Hong Kong in March, we were ambushed at at Kantian, we'd, we'd been on a sweep that went from Camlo to Kantian, and uh, <clears throat> we, we kicked it off, and this March was right after the rainy season, and it was getting into the fighting season, as they said, and uh, we started the sweep, and, and we had sporadic contact with the enemy, and they were here and there, lots of signs that they were around, you know, and, and uh, we'd 
you know, from day to day, we'd, we'd get in little firefights with them, and we're kind of chasing them and follow them. And so we, we were out there probably four or five days, I guess, and we were running low on ammo, and we, we, any chance we got, we always got fuel. So the, the grunts decided they need to resupply, so we can take a half a day to resupply. Well, our gunner at the time, our, our main gunner, the guy that usually was our gunner, he was gone on leave. So we had Walter Eulings, he was a corporal, a real short timer, he was our stand-in gunner. So when they did the resupply, they came from the rear area and they said, if Eulings wants to come back, because he was due to rotate, we can send somebody out to take his place. And he says, no, nah, he says, I'll stay until we get to Contien in the next couple of days and then I'll go back then. So, you know, okay. So we resupply, you know, we refuel, you know, get, get new, new ammunition and stuff. And we continue on with this, this sweep, you know. We, the contact starts to get heavier and heavier. and We're spending more time finding more bunkers and stuff like that. So we we're go up into an area that used to be a village there, and we every time we'd go through this area, we'd end up getting ambushed or you know having contact. So they had gone in and torn the village down. By this time, that area was a free fire zone. You could you know if somebody was there, they were you know they were a target. Well, you explain what a free fire zone is. Free fire means there shouldn't be any personnel there. There should just be. You know, if there's personnel there, they're enemy, and you're, you can shoot them. You know, man, woman, child, doesn't make any difference. They're the bad guy. So this, this really, unlike other parts of Vietnam where you're trying to pick out who's the enemy, we knew if they were there, they were the enemy. So we, this, this area was like on a short plateau, and there was only like one, one way up. And we didn't like the fact that you had to take this like road up there, you know, so we're looking for mines and stuff, and we knew the area, so we were really wary of it. And uh, we pull up into the, about halfway across this open area, and we hear this explosion behind us. Well, a tank behind us somehow catches a mine, and we think it was probably command, det you know, detonated. They were waiting for it, and uh, so we couldn't back down because they were in the way. And uh, we stop, and then all of a sudden, just all hell breaks loose. I mean, there was RPGs all over the place, you know, small arm fire, machine gun fire and everything. So the, the grunts are firing. We're, we're firing canister rounds, you know, as fast as we can load them. And, and when I was driving, I'd never, ever, until this point, would put my seat down, close the hatch, and lock it down. I would put my seat down. And sometimes I'd pull the hatch over me, but I never ever locked it down. I don't know, I just, I felt like I couldn't do my job real well if I was all buttoned up like that. But this time, I don't know if it was intensity, the fire or what it was, but I closed and locked the hatch. So I'm sitting there and they're, they're firing the gun, you know, and it's, it's at about the 10 o'clock position, 10, 11 o'clock position over the left front fender. So that puts the gunner right behind me. And so, I'm sitting there and I'm kind of looking back into the turret and all of a sudden there's this huge flash and sparks and, you know, smoke and everything and then the fire comes. Well, we'd taken an RPG right through the front of the turret and it had hit the gunner in the chest, Eulings, and killed him instantly, you know, and it had gone through the hydraulic system. So you have all this hydraulic oil and it's all running down under my ass and it's on fire. and so, you know, I, the, my first instinct was to be, start backing the tank down if I could. So I reached down and I, and I jerked it into reverse and, and hit the accelerator and there was nothing. The engine just sat there and kind of loped, you know. So I tell CU, I says, We're, the engine's dead, you know. And so he says, well, we can't put the fire out because he pulled what fire suppression we had and our loader had a fire extinguisher and he was spraying. But, that hydraulic fluid is just almost impossible to extinguish. So, you know, I'm sitting there and it's getting hot. And I'm saying, well, if I jump out, I'm dead. I know, but I know if I stay here, I'm dead. So do you want to burn to death or do you want to get shot? So I said, well, I think I'll get shot. So see about that time, Siva says, 
we got to we got to abandon. We got to get out of here. And he says, "Leave Eulings. He's dead." He says, you know, "So, I pop the hatch and I just like I don't know. I was like like a jack in the box. And I spring up out of the hatch and I over the gun tube and I don't think I ever touched anything. And I'm hit the ground and I'm running and there's rounds going, you know, small arm fire, and, you know, stuff going on. And there's a little bush back by the by the rear of the tank on the right side. So I dive behind this bush, you know. And you can hear the, the rounds cracking in the bush and stuff. And there's Siva and Hamby, and neither of them were, were small people, you know. They were big, and there's one little bush, you know, and there's the dirt's flying and stuff. So I said, I, we, we, I go, so I go over to the, to the left behind the tank and dive into the, the brush and like elephant grass there. And so I dive into this elephant. I still have my calm helmet on. I don't I just never thought to take it off. Siva runs straight back, and Hamby, for some reason, he's crawling toward the enemy, you know. So Siva's yelling at Hamby. I'm in the grass listening to all this, and then I can hear the NVA talking. You know, they're like, I don't know, just a few yards away. And then all of a sudden, this plop in front of me, and there's a hand grenade, one of these chai calm, you know, potato mashers. And I'm going, oh, shit, it's too far for I can't reach it. You know, but it's close enough that I figure if it goes off, well, I lay there and it, it doesn't go off. You know, so thankfully it was a dud. So I think, well, you know, so I got to get out. So I start crawling through the grass and I come to like a little clearing and then across on the other side of this clearing, there's a Twin 40, which is a army tracked vehicle that was actually an anti-aircraft gun, but they found that they worked pretty good in Nam. You know, they were, they were good. So these guys, they're, they're pumping rounds out like crazy, you know. And I, I can see one of the loaders, and I know if I get up and run, they're probably gonna shoot me because they think I'm NVA. So I stick my head out and I kind of wave my hand at this guy, you know, and I finally get his attention, and you know, and so he's telling everybody else, hey, there's a, there's a Marine coming out. So I jump, he waves me in there, and I jump up and I run across this little clearing and I dive behind the track, you know. And I'm, I'm going, oh man, you know, the guy says, comes down, he says, you okay? And I said, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm fine, I'm nothing wrong. He says, well, what's all the blood? And I said, well, so I look down at my, my left side and my whole leg is covered in blood, you know. My arm is all, like all bloody and stuff. So he calls for a corpsman, and corpsman comes over there. And he look, kind of looks at me and he says, okay, let's go, go back here, I'll take you back to where we're setting up the wounded. And he takes me back down there and there's Hamby and Siva and, uh, bunch of other grunts that have been been you know injured so we're you know just thankful you know we we got through this and uh, so the guy brings in a, a grunt and he says put your hand on this the guy has a sucking chest wound so he says just just hold your hand there until i can get a dressing on this thing so i'm holding this as long as i'm holding it, the guy's breathing pretty good and uh so the he dresses it and there's a couple of there's one guy laying over there and he's He's sucking air real bad, you know, he's not, he's not gonna make it. It's that death, that death, you know, rattle. So the, this firefight's going on the whole time, you know, and we can hear the small arms in the tank starting to cook off from the fire, you know, but the, the big rounds haven't started to explode yet. But we know that they're, they're on their way, you know, and you can see the, the fire's kind of shooting up out of the tank, you know, like a blowtorch. And so the corpsman says, okay, they're, gonna, they're bringing in medevac helicopters. He said, well, medevac, they're, they're really serious guys first. And he says, then you, you ambulatory guys will take you and the dead out second on the second chopper. So, you know, we said, that's great with us. So they, you know, these two choppers show up and they're circling kind of overhead. And the first one tries to come in and he just, you know, catches all kinds of fire, you know. So he aborts the first try and comes back second try he gets it down they get the wounded loaded on it you know and these are the old helicopters these aren't the Hueys these are the old what are the CH-34s I think they were the old piston engine ones you know which is that's just slow as hell so the first helicopter he gets loaded up and he pulls up you know and you can hear the rounds hitting the chopper as he leaves and then he leaves the firefight had kind of died down. There was just sporadic, sporadic you know, gunfire. Second chopper comes in. Well, he starts, as soon as he starts in, man, the, the, you know, the, the gunfire was unbelievable. 
you know, and he sets it down, and we crawl on this thing, and uh, he pulls it up, and, and you can see the, the bullet holes as the bullets go through the chopper, you know, and you're just thinking, we ain't gonna make this. But he pulls it up and just, you know, we, we made it, went back to Dong Ha. They treated my wounds, and then really I had a shrapnel wound in my left hip, you know, and a lot of little stuff all over. But the main thing was the doctor looked at me and he said, in my eye, they thought I'd lost pressure in my eye, so, you know, the whole side of my face was burned and everything. So he says, I'm gonna send you to the hospital ship to have your eye checked out. So I said, that's great with me, loving it. So they flew us out there, me and Siva. Hamby was treated there and he was released that same day. But uh, that tank burned for like three days. And uh, they said that it was when J.J. Carroll said they went out like two weeks later to tow it in and it was still warm to the touch. Why they towed it in, I don't know, but he said, well, the Marine Corps, you know, the Marine Corps had been Army, they'd have left it there. There was nothing worth having, you know, but the Marine Corps said, well, yeah, at least the sprockets, take the sprockets, because that was a big deal. So they, they actually towed it back to Dong Ha. I took pictures of it back there, you know. Now, do you recall when this all took place, what the date was? It was March 6th, 67. Yeah, yeah, that was the day we got, we got ambushed. And uh, that was the first actual tank that was ever actually taken out of commission with an RPG over there. And after that, before that, the NVA had been scared of tanks. You know, they wouldn't really, really confront you. But that day, we don't know if, you know, if, if that was the plan, but it looked like it was the plan because they tried to trap us to where we couldn't get back down off of that hill. You know, so we were just shooting ducks. And I mean, when we pulled up there, the NVA were within, within oh, probably 10 feet of the tank in front of, they were so, so close in front that we couldn't get the gun tube down to use the machine gun, you know. So we kind of think that their, their whole objective was to kill a tank. And after that, they had no fear of tanks because you know, they, knew, they knew that their weaponry would, would do some real damage. And they had gotten really good at using it and they had developed their tactics. So from that time forward, and that's one of the reasons why I went on r and R. I just, you know, Five days away from there was five days away from there, you know, so. Now, when you, when they took you to the hospital ship to be repaired, so to speak, uh, was that the end of your tour at that point? Were you shipped home or did you come back? No, I went, went to the hospital ship. They, they took me in, they triaged, looked at, you know, superficial wounds basically. Took me down to x-ray, took x-rays, you know, so they could see where all the pieces and parts were. And, uh, you know, then they took me into the eye doctor and he looked at mine and he says, well, it doesn't look real good. He says, I really can't tell if it was penetrated or not. But he says, time will tell. He says, if it's not better in like five days, he said, we'll, we'll ship you back to the Philippines. So I'm thinking, yeah, you know, this is, this is a ticket home. So I'm, you know, hospital life is good on the ship. You know, it's nice and clean, hot meals. Siva's on the ship too, well, he's kind of, you know, he's a crazy kind of guy, so he's, he's like antsy as hell. He doesn't like the ship, you know. We'd, we'd get together and talk, and he says, wow, ah. he says, I'm out of here. He went up to the flight deck, got on a helicopter. He wasn't released or anything. He had a cast on his, on his hand, and his, upper, his lower arm. Gets on the helicopter, flies back into some place, I don't know where it was, Chulai or someplace, finds a, a tank battalion or tank company goes to the maintenance guy and tells the maintenance guy, you gotta cut this cast off my hand. And the guy said, well, I can't do that. And he says, you better do it or I'll beat the shit out of you. <laughs> and Seabood would have done it too. So he cut the cast off his hand and he returned back to the unit and I guess was good after that, but he was just, just crazy like that. But I was on there probably three weeks until the wounds pretty much healed up. And, the thing was, after about four days, my eye started, the, the vision started to come back in my eye, and I'm going, ah, damn, you know. So I went back to the unit, and I went back, and uh, I didn't know it, but the, the very day after we had gotten ambushed, they got into another ambush, and we had another one of our guys got killed there, a good, a good friend of mine, Joe Milos. He was, got caught in, he was a loader, and he was up on top, and they got into the ambush, and a machine gun caught him. You know, so that was not good. 
So you went back sometime in early April. Then, yeah. 67. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and we continued to operate in that area up there. We were at Contian, we were at GLN, Camp Carroll, you know, Rockpile, the whole I Corps. You know, we lost in, in, in our platoon. Well, J.J. Carroll told me yesterday, the 32 guys that he said rotated in and out in the base of that platoon, there was eight people killed and everybody except one wounded. And we were, because we went up there early and we were away from our company, we were first platoon Car Charlie Company and then Alpha Company moved to Dong Ha. They were, they were kind of, we were kind of under them, but we were still Charlie Company. Well, as as uh, R.B. English says, we were the gypsy platoon. R.B. was our, our platoon sergeant for, from January 67 till I left. And uh, you know, the greatest platoon sergeant you could ever have. Just a great guy. But uh, we lost eight guys in, in five months. You know, so most of it was artillery. We lost two at GLN from an artillery strike. We lost four at Contien from artillery. And then the others were actually in, out in ambushes and stuff. And it was, it was, so when I left, I got ready to leave and uh, I was due to leave in, in uh, August. August 5th was my rotation date. 67. 67. And we were at Contien. It had been right after Operation Buffalo. We had been there and then we, were, we had gone someplace else. I don't remember where we were. And then when, when Operation Buffalo kicked off and 1-9 got into the shit down there, they called us back up there because they had so many tanks that were disabled from the platoon that was there, the Alpha Company platoon. So we went down, we were one of the tanks that went down and pulled the dead out you know, like three or four days after the ambush. We, you know, we were still getting ambushed going down there. We pulled out a lot of dead and that was, that was not a pretty sight. That was, that was not good. But uh, we operated through that whole area. Spent most of our time at Contien probably. We were the first tanks to go to Contien. We went to Contien before there was a road there. You know, you know that was, but Contien was good then. We went up there, lived in a small bunker. We weren't getting the artillery rounds that they did later and uh, did patrols out of there on a daily basis. And we ran into some ambushes and stuff, but not as, it wasn't as severe as it was in the summer of 67. We were there in, in 66 from probably, oh, I don't know, October through till Christmas time. And it was, it was, you know, fairly routine. But when we went back after that was when the NVA were really artillerying the, the base and, you know, you'd go out. That's when they built the trace, the, the, bulldozed area that ran from GLN to Contient. We would go down with the CBs on their bulldozers and stuff and the engineers and try to protect them, which was almost impossible, you know, and things like that. So then you rotated back, you said in August of 67? Yeah, I, we were at Contient and, and on probably the 24th, 25th of August, they, the, the lieutenant tells me, he says, get your gear together. They said for you to come back to Dong Ha and get ready to go home. So, you know, I'm, I'm all for this. And we were getting new guys, a lot of new guys because of, of what had happened in Buffalo. A lot of guys were wounded. So we were getting a lot of new people. And uh, so I got my gear and I got on the truck and I went back to Dong Ha. And I'm, I'm laying low back there trying to stay away from everybody, you know, so they don't bother me. And uh, on the 27th of July, I kind of hear there was a comm bunker there and I kind of hear a lot of chatter at the comm bunker, which was unusual, you know, and so I, I kind of asked around, what's going on? They said, well, they said they had an artillery attack at Contien. They said they got a bunch of guys killed. So this is not good because I know my people are up there, you know, so I kind of check around. Then I get this guy comes and says, hey, the first sergeant wants to see you. I said, okay. So I go in the first sergeant. The first sergeant said, they've had a bunch of guys from your platoon get killed. He says, I need you to go down to Graves Registration and do identifications. So I go down to Graves Registration, you know, and there's Miles Jansen, who was a very, really good friend of mine. And uh, he's dead. And uh, 
Ludwig, which, who was a, a new guy, and uh, Flanagan, who, who was actually the guy that came and took my place. He was a corporal. He came in to take my place and, and my tank. And, uh, you know, I was, I was devastated with this. You know, I thought, Jesus Christ, go all this way and then lose people like that. So I go back to the company here, and the first sergeant says, I, he needs me to, to go in to talk to the maintenance people and find a tank that's not totally disabled. And you need to go back to Contien, he said. He said, I want you to take a tank and go back, because he had several that were disabled up there that weren't able to. So we, I went down, I talked to the maintenance chief, you know, and, and I'm just, this is just devastating. So I talked to the maintenance chief. We find a tank that has the, the drive motor for the turret that's, that's bad, and it, you have to turn the turret by hand. But everything else works, the guns work, you know, the, mechanically it's everything else. He says, we just don't have the parts here for it yet. He says, but they'll be here in the next couple of days. So I said, okay. So, and there was two new guys that were in the tent with me. And so the first sergeant says, Get, take these two new guys. And he says, in the morning with the convoy, it's going to Condi and you go up, you know, and, and report into your lieutenant. So these two new guys, they, their boots aren't even dirty yet. You know, I mean, they are, you know, FNGs. Yeah. So, you know, Pretty and I'd, I'd... Straight out of tank school. Straight out of tank school. They'd been there like two days. You know, they were just waiting to, to go up to Contien or wherever they were going to go to. So, I, I, and I'd talk to the guys, you know, and they were asking me all kinds of questions. Well, how's this? How's that? You know, really, I'm not telling, you know, you're, this, you're really in the shit here. You know, you, this is not going to be a good time for you. But I'm not telling them that. You know, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah everything's going to be all right. You know, so I go and I tell them, okay, get your shit together. We're going north in the morning. And they said, well, yeah. So these two guys, they don't know how to drive a tank. So I'm going to drive the tank. I'm not, they're not going to drive the tank. I said, put the one guy up in the turret. I said, you just keep your eyes open. And he says, if you hear any gunfire, get your ass down. And I told the other guy, get in the tank and don't get out. Don't stick your head out, nothing. You just stay down there until we get there. Because it wasn't that far from Dong Ha up to Contien, really, depending on the convoy driver and how fast he'd go. And I told the, we were the, f the first vehicle in line after the escort jeep, and I told the escort jeep driver, I says, don't get in my way because I'll run your ass over. I says, because I'm putting this sucker on the floor and it's not letting off until we get to Contien. Because we'd had ambushes between there, you know, and stuff. And so we went back to Contien, you know, and, and I talked to the lieutenant and he set me up with a crew and stuff. And our first thing was we were doing road sweeps out of Contien every morning down to what they called, now, later it was called the washout, but it was actually just a, there was no base there when I was there. It was just a turnaround point, you know. They'd sweep the road up from the south, and we swept down from the north. So, and J.J. Carroll was, it was me and him as tank commanders on the two tanks on this sweep, because everybody else was in the hospital or dead, you know. So we were really, really short of crew guys. So we take this thing, we go down there, we get down to the turnaround. Well, some stupid gook over there starts firing his 57 recoilless rifle at us, you know. So I, this pisses me off, you know. You can't just, you gotta screw with us. So I'm, I'm you know, I'm talking to the grunt com guy, you know, lieutenant or whoever's running the, the sweep, you know, and he says, can you put some, some smoke on that? He says, we'll call in the, the fly boys and they'll take care of this. So I fire a canister round, or a, a Willie Peter round, a white phosphorus round down there and puts off a white cloud so you mark the area where you want them to hit. Well, the, the round kind of is funny when it goes off, you know, it's not, it's not like a normal round. So, so I think it was Hamby was loading for me. Hamby says, hey, we got crap in the gun barrel, in the tube. So I looked down there, well, it hadn't burnt all the, the, the pellets of powder and they were all through the two. So our, gun, our gun's at down, we can't fire out of that. So JJ, he's firing, so we kind of back down and we're firing 50 and 30 caliber down in there. And then the planes come in, you know, and they just drop about four or five bombs on there and the whole area is, you know, it was a little thicket of trees and brush and stuff. Well, it's just leveled now, you know, so. They the grunts go down there and they find scraps of bodies and stuff and, and the gun, the 57 recoilless. So we head back up to Contien, you know. I said, that's enough of this crap, you know. I'm, I'm had, by this time, I'm probably into, way, well past my 
rotation date. You know, your, it's your well beyond being a one digit midget. Yeah, exactly. You know, so my our lab, you know, the lieutenants telling me we go into briefing one day and they had patrols going out every day and you know, and every time they went outside the wire, you were you were getting into the shit. So the lieutenant tells me one day, my my turn to go out. You know, he says your your tank batteries are dead dead today, right? And I go, well, no. Why why do you say that? He says, yeah, your tank batteries are dead. You're not going anywhere. So I stay inside the perimeter. Well, this goes on for several days, and then finally everybody gets the idea, you know. So I have to go out. So they they send us out with a recon team on the back of the tank. You know, it's a four-man recon team. These, we did this with these guys quite often. So we go out on this patrol with, with a contingent of grunts. I don't know how many it was. It wasn't a company size. It was probably two or three platoons sweeping area. So this, this uh, recon team leader, he says, we're just going to hang out on the back of your tank until we get to an area where, that we want to get to. And he says, then we'll just disappear into the brush, so don't worry if you don't see us anymore. So we're diddy bopping along there, and I'm watching. I look back, well, these guys are gone. They're, they've, they've dropped off someplace. And we go on, and it's really, you know, it, to me it's unusually quiet. You kind of get, after a while, a sixth sense of when things aren't right. You know, even, even with being in tanks, you know, the noise and the smoke and the, all that, you still get a, an idea of your surroundings. We sweep on down, you know, and I'm telling this, this commander of the grunts, you know, I says, there's something not right here, something's not good. We're, we should be seeing something or, you know, but we're not seeing anything. So we go down a little ways and we stop for, to have lunch. You know, they're going to take a break and they set up a perimeter and stuff. We're about halfway through this, this 10, 10, 15 minute break. We start hearing, you know, firefight back up toward where we dropped off the recon team. You know, and it goes on for quite a while, and then we see a chopper coming in. The chopper comes in, then the chopper leaves. So I tell the lieutenant, I said, you know what, that was that recon team. I said, they, they found something, and somebody found them. I says, and they came and got them. So he, you know, says, okay. I says, this is what we need to do. I says, you need to mount your guys up. And we never like to have grunts mounted on the tanks, because it, it, it's just too big a target. But I says, you mount your guys up. I says, we're hauling ass back for Conti. And I says, because they're going to ambush us on the way back. I knew it. So he, he agreed. He was like, hadn't been there very long. And he was kind of green. But he was, he was agreeable to that. So we mounted everybody up. And we turned around. We hauled ass. And we went right through the ambush. And, and, and I can remember just as fast as we could travel. And it was pretty flat land. And, uh, this one area, I knew where they were going to ambush us, you know, so I just told everybody to get down, you know, told the grunts to hang on, and we just blew right through the ambush. I remember the, the RPGs just going like this, you know, and, the, you know, and uh, we head back to Conti, and that was my last combat. And then, like, a couple days later, the lieutenant said, get on the truck, because you're going home. So I went back to Dong Ha, and I was there like a day, and then down to, to Fubai, where 3rd Marine Division had moved to Fubai by this time. And I uh, was there for a day, and then I was gone. 13 months and 12 days. How many? 13 months and 12 days. Now, did you fly back to Okinawa at that point? I flew back to Okinawa. I was there not too long, maybe two days at the most. You know, and then I flew into El Toro, and I took a bus from El Toro to the to the airport because I had to, I couldn't go directly. I lived in California at that time, still do, same house, you know, and I, well, I had to get a bus home. So I went to the bus, went to the airport, got a taxi at the airport, went to the bus station in my uniform. Nobody ever said a word to me. Went in the bar in the bus station, had a beer. Nobody said a word. Got on the bus, came home. My wife didn't know I was coming home. Because there was really, I didn't have any idea when I would, would, would leave there, and you know, the whole situation was so chaotic. Got home, well, she's at, she's at the hospital with her friend having a baby. So she comes home, and I'm with the woman next door having a beer. And the woman knew, she didn't know me, but she, she knew that I had, had been, was in Vietnam and that I was coming home sometime then. So she kind of took care of me till my wife got home. 
And now this is when in 67 you got home? This was August of 67. Okay. Yeah. You, you came home when I went to boot camp. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> okay. Well, Rick, thank you very much. Uh, it's at the minimum interesting. Beyond yeah. that, it's really, it was really a great. I, I am glad I did not serve with you because you were a dangerous <laughs> guy to be around. Yeah. And uh, thank you very much for your time and your willingness to talk for the record. Yeah. And uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of the reunion. I think I will.